profesor Christian Stesi. Uh, él es, he's originally from Austria. He works in the United States. First he was in the University of Missouri, and now he's at Taylor. He has made important contributions in spectral theory, uh, differential equations, relativistic equations, and some other areas. It's for me really a pleasure to have him here. I know him for more than 20 years already. And it's the first time he's in Cuernavaca, so it's a real pleasure to have him. Please, Fritz. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Is it okay? Because usually I have troubles filling uh, a room with my voice. Okay, so I'd like to thank Carlos and uh, Rafael for the idea of having this uh, summer school, and in particular choosing a topic that's dear to our heart, mathematical physics. So, unlike uh, Hermann, I'm not going to talk about mathematical physics per se, but about methods in mathematical physics. But there will be plenty of applications, so it's, it's not devoid. But in some sense, it's a little more about a tool that you can use in various circumstances in mathematical physics. So let me uh, explain that tool. So it has to do with uh, the spectral shift function. And I'm going to do this uh, in, in three parts. So today, we're going to do the basics. On uh, Wednesday, we're going to do index theory. So I, I promised Herman I would define a uh, Fredholm index on Wednesday and beyond that. And on Friday, we do some applications to differential operators, ordinary and partial. OK, so that's the plan for, for the week. Anyway, um, here's a little bit of uh, outline. Ah, before I go to that, very important. It's very quiet here. So I, there were hardly any questions except by the senior guys uh, during a lecture. So never hesitate to interrupt. I have tons of material, and I cannot do it anyway. So I'll be happy to stop much earlier. I don't have a particular thing I need to do. So anytime you have a question, interrupt. Also among the senior ones that guess that I'm talking about something that isn't necessarily understood by everyone, please interrupt. OK? So uh, let's make this a little interactive if, if we can. All right. So. Going back to that, I'll introduce a little notation, then uh, the basics about the, oops, sorry for that. I need to find, oh, here it is. Need to find, uh, uh, so we'll talk about uh, the spectral shift function itself, and then a slight uh, application today to Schrodinger operators, and then something that's relatively new, even to the experts, I assume. It's about continuity of spectral shift functions. So that's something that's not in the book literature at all. It's actually based on a paper that came out um, very recently. OK, so that's the plan for today. Let me talk a little about motivation. Why would anyone want to be interested in a spectral shift function? Well, the uh, main driving force behind this is perturbation theory, and in particular, the idea of perturbing spectra. So in essence, you should think of an unperturbed operator H0, like the kinetic energy operator that you know very well. Then you'd like to perturb it by a potential. And you wonder, how do the spectral properties change when you go from H0 to H? So we have a pair of operators, in, in other words. That's very typical in connection with spectral shift functions. They don't come with one operator. They come with pairs, typically of self-adjoint or unitary operators. So here's the basic problem. I just said it. Given spectral properties of H0, which you usually can diagonalize and you know everything about it, what can you say about the non-trivial 
object H. Now, as it's said in blue here, that's all a lot easier said than done, but I mean, that's why spectral theory has become a, a fairly independent subject over the decades. And again, here is sort of the standard example one can think of, just very elementary two-body quantum mechanics. H0 would model kinetic energy, so the Laplacian, typically. V models potential energy, and the total Hamiltonian is represented by a sum. Now, when it comes to spectral theory, uh, there is sort of two natural divisions. One is you look for eigenvalues. Spectrum, let's say discrete spectrum, that means isolated eigenvalues, uh, isolated from each other and the rest of the spectrum. So think of bound states in a quantum system. That certainly is one part that has attracted lots of attentions. Um, there's a famous book by Carter on perturbation theory of linear operators, first edition from 1966. Even today, I would say it's still the Bible on the subject. But then, of course, there is the other part, which is very interesting, and, and something that you do not see in the finite dimensional context, and that's continuous spectrum. Now, I don't want to go into details. Continuous spectrum can be horribly complicated because there's a singular and an absolutely continuous spectrum. I presume that uh, Svetlana will talk about the singular continuous spectrum. I'm going to stay away from it. So uh, when you deal with spectral sheet functions, you're dealing with either discrete spectrum or the absolutely continuous spectrum. The uh, singular continuous part plays no role in our, in our context. So we will avo avoid that. But just think in terms of the bands that, uh, the spectral bands that Hermann had on the blackboard today, that would correspond to continuous spectrum. The eigenvalue zero, for instance, whether it was one or not, the zero mode, that would be a, a good example of discrete spectrum. Now, of course, life is more complicated. You can also have eigenvalues embedded in the continuous spectrum. Uh, that's for another summer school, not for, for this one. So th this is a totally different subject. Uh, very interesting, obviously, but it, it's not something I'm going to uh, spend too much time on. It's not quite true. On Wednesday, when we do Fretum theory and then the Witten index, there is a little bit of that, but just scratching the surface. Anyway, today's spectral theory is a vast area in operator theory. It has its own journal devoted to it, making a little advertisement. Anyway, so you said that, <laughs> but it's true. Anyway, so let me start out with a bit of notation that will, you will see this three times, so Wednesday and Friday I repeat it again, but it's, it's all very basic. Hilbert spaces are denoted by the script H. The identity operator typically is written like that. If you have a, looking, if you're looking at a closed, typically self-adjoint operator for us in that Hilbert space, then the resolvent set so this is where a minus z is uh, a bijection. This denoted by rho, the complement by sigma. That's the spectrum of the operator. And for those who are not so much uh, worse in uh, infinite dimensional situations, all of what I'm telling you applies to finite dimensions. So everything we do today and uh, a good part also on Wednesday, not so much on Friday, applies to matrices, okay? So it's just that matrices are a little boring. They don't have continuous spectrum. They can only have discrete spectrum. But apart from that, a lot applies. All these notions, of course, apply to matrices. If you want to discuss the point spectrum, so the set of eigenvalues, I'll denote this by sigma p, if I want to be a subset of that, the discrete spectrum, those are the isolated eigenvalues of finite algebraic multiplicity in case you're not self-adjoint. In a self-adjoint case, you don't have to make this distinction. That's sigma d. And if the operator is closable, that's not obvious in infinite dimensions, its closure will be denoted by the bar. So that's not complex conjugation. That's the closure of an operator. 
Also, what should be obvious, all operators will be linear. So I'm not going to do anything about nonlinear operators. Here is a little continuation of that, pretty much the last part of this notation. So we will talk a lot about the set of bounded operators on our Hilbert space H. That's B. That's Cato's notation. So I'm, I'm following Cato. BP, these are so-called trace ideals. And perhaps the most prominent of them for sure is B1. That's the set of trace class operators. So those are operators for which you can compute a trace and it has the usual properties. Okay? I'll have a, uh, a, a sort of a definition here, but let me go back to, to this part first. What about B2? That's a very interesting class of operators. It's called the Hilbert-Schmidt operators. And they are very nice because they are easy to characterize. Trace class operators are much nicer, but very hard to characterize. The fact that it has a trace doesn't define a trace class operator. You have to be much more sophisticated to define the class of trace class operators. But with Hilbert-Schmidt, it's very simple. All Hilbert-Schmidt operators can be unitarily equivalent transformed into an integral operator. And once you have an integral operator with an integral kernel, the operator is Hilbert-Schmidt if and only if, so this is best possible, you cannot beat this, if and only if the integral kernel is square integrable with respect to both variables and whatever measure space you're working with. Okay? So that's a very, very convenient and easy to check criterion. No such thing for trace class operators. It's a lot, more, a lot more interesting when it comes to trace class operators. What is true, however, every trace class operator is a product of two Hilbert-Schmidt operators. And conversely, a product of two Hilbert-Schmidt operators is trace class. But if I give you a trace class operator and then I ask you to find the two that define whose product defines the operator, good luck. That's not the way to, uh, to prove trace class properties. So that one has developed sophisticated techniques for that. That's a, a different and interesting topic. But I just want to warn you, while this class is the nicest of them, it's also the hardest to characterize. Hilbert-Schmidt operators are easy to characterize. Finally, B infinity, so formally P goes to infinity, will denote a set of compact operators. Sometimes I need more than bounded. Bounded might not always be enough. And so we have these additional classes here. Now, if you have a trace class operator, then you can actually compute its trace like the matrix trace, which also happens to be the sum over the diagonals if you have a matrix situation. It's much more interesting what this does in infinite dimensions. It's typically, if you view it as an integral operator, the integral over the diagonal of the integral kernel. But, Again, a warning. When that integral is finite, this doesn't mean a thing about trace class property of the operator. It's, it, is more, it is a consequence, but it is not uh, implying the property. So uh, what's so simple in the matrix context, you just sum the diagonal terms, or you would do integrate over the diagonal. The sum in the matrix case is, is perfect. The integral situation is more complicated. There are wonderful books on this. Gochberg Krein, for instance, is one. Um, book by Simon on trace ideals. Anyway, so there is plenty of literature out there. So the trace, if it exists, so if you have a trace class operator, then the trace exists. And it is really uh, what's also called Litsky's theorem, because this was proven relatively late in the game. It is the sum of the eigenvalues. The sum is absolutely convergent. Uh, sometimes we will talk about determinants, infinite determinants, so Fredholm determinants. They work whenever you have a trace class perturbation of the identity. And then the determinant is exactly what you expect, the product of 1 minus the eigenvalues. You see, you need the identity here. Otherwise, if this is an infinite product, you cannot guarantee convergence. You need to have small deviations of 1. Otherwise, the infinite product makes no sense. So that's why a small deviation in a precise manner means a trace class operator perturbing the identity. Sometimes 
You would like to define a determinant also for Hilbert Schmidt operators. Can be done, no problem. And it's a regularized determinant. You see, you have, to, you have what you expect, the product of one minus the eigenvalues. But then there is a factor here. And don't be fooled by the plus, I have a minus here. So this is a, a factor that helps to make this product convergent. So it's actually convergence accelerating. In fact, those who are familiar with a little bit of complex analysis and Hadama product formulas, the convergence producing factors, they are exactly factors of this type. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, actually. That's called a modified freedom determinant. So sometimes we will, I, I will show you examples uh, a little later today about the Hilbert-Schmidt situation, and we'll look at that. All right, some pictures. So here are the giants of uh, the field for this particular talk today. Uh, that's certainly true. Apparently, it was a physicist, theoretical physicist, who first wrote down, and apparently in a rigorous fashion, a spectral shift function. Now, you see, and I disagree a little. So I, I stole a, for, for the Friday lecture, I stole a part of my lecture from a lecture that UC gave. And he says that Ilya Mikhailovich Lifshitz did it for finite rank operators. I always thought it was for rank one only. So I don't know. Are you sure about finite rank? OK, so I thought, anyway, for rank one, for sure. So these are very simple operators basically projection-like operators, for which he derived the concept. And as far as we can see, it's correct. It's, it's rigorous. Now, whether it's finite rank or not, he didn't do the trace class case. This is what uh, a giant in the, f in the field, Mark Krein, did. He did it in a series of papers. So he started in 53, and pretty much by 63, all the, all the, the, the basic formalism was in place. All right. <clears throat> so here is a very short course on the Klein spectral shift function. Rather than defining it immediately, I'm going to first tell you what it can do for you, which is fairly remarkable. It computes traces for pairs of operators. So let's take a look. So we have two self-adjoint operators. Think of this as the unperturbed one, and think of H as the perturbation. So think of something like this. I put uh, quotation marks around the plus, because the plus can be very general. You can do quadratic form perturbations. You can do operator perturbations. This is not so important for today. Let's just assume we have two, a pair of self-adjoint operators, which are not too far apart. Now, what the heck do I mean by not too far apart? There are three basic classes, and depending on in which class you are working in, the technical difficulties get bigger and bigger, the more general the class. So the simplest situation by far is what uh, Krein at first started after Lifshitz, namely that the difference of H and H0 is a trace class operator. So in other words, H is H0 plus a trace class operator. That's by far the simplest situation. Then you can do what's called a relative trace class situation, where you say, no, V itself is not trace class. And imagine you're working with, say, differential operators. Then V is typically multiplication by a function. That's never trace class. There's no, 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 no chance whatsoever that this would ever be trace class. Multiplications op multiplication operators have continuous spectrum generically. Once you have essential continuous spectrum away from just one point, you cannot be trace class. So we need to do better. And in order to do better, I offer two possibilities. A sort of a medium one is this one, where you say, no, V is not trace class. But when you multiply from the right with the resolvent of H0, that should be trace class. That actually is true for differential operators in some situations, in one dimensions in particular. This is easily verified. So this is, this is a, a good condition already. By far the most interesting one, but also
The hardest case to handle is when the, just the difference of the resorbance is trace class. That's the most general one. And in many ways, uh, much more difficult than uh, the first case in particular. Anyway, in all these three cases, we can do it. We can define a spectral shift function, and I will, uh, I will eventually get to that. But what I wanted to start with was not a definition, but in fact, what can this function do for us? So I'm denoting it from now on in all three lectures by C. There's an energy variable here, lambda typically, and then h and h0, the pair of self adjoint operators. And you see what it does for you is it computes the difference, so the trace of a difference of functions of h and h0. Well, these functions can be, I'm writing here for appropriate, I'll talk a little about that. So for instance, resolvents will be good functions, powers of resolvents will be just as good functions. If h and h0 are bounded from below, you will see a semigroup. So an exponential is a great function, and so on. So there's plenty of functions that we can talk about. It's on uh, a little bit uh, on, on, on this page. So here's the resolvent example. Please. Yes? Is a multiplicative potential already one of those two classes that you can a, a multiplicative uh, operator, potential. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, so let me, let me go back. So both cases, 2 and 3, multiplicative is okay. In particular, in one dimension, so for one dimension Schrodinger operators, this is very easily uh, verified with, with uh, sufficiently decaying potentials here. So in fact, first moment finite would be enough. Okay? And here, you can... Uh, go even to three dimensions, one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. At one point, you will need modified freedom determinants. We will see this. But this is still true, what, what's written there. The difference of resorbance in three dimensions for a sufficiently decaying potential multiplicative, uh, so operator of multiplication by a function v of x, satisfies this condition. So this, this are, these are highly non-trivial conditions. Now, I should say immediately, and probably um, UC will say a little bit more about this. If you really want to study PDEs in high dimensions, so higher than three, this is a problem. What is true is, though, that powers of resor resorbance, depending on the dimension you are interested in, can still be trace class. And one can work with that. And I will do a little on that on Friday, but I suppose you see, yeah, you're not. Oh, it's not getting there. Okay. Uh, oh, you will see some of that on Friday. But the higher the dimension, space dimension, the harder it is to satisfy this. One, two, and three is okay. Beyond three is a problem with multiplication, even if they are compactly supported, so really sharply decaying, no, not good enough. But there are ways around that. So it's, it's especially the, the, the semi-group picture is very general and very useful. So I have a few examples here. The uh, resolvent example is there. And you see here's the, the derivative of the function 1 over lambda minus c is, of course, up to this minus sign, the 1 over lambda minus z squared. Here's the exponential version of this. So for heat, uh, I wanted to say heat kernels, but never mind. For semigroups, if h0 is bounded from below, then with the conditions we had before, 1, 2, or 3, uh, H is also bounded from below, and so both semigroups make sense, and you get a formula like that. One can uh, say a little about the classes of functions that are permitted. So, for instance, uh, you can have certain functions whose derivative are a Fourier transform of a complex measure. Uh, this is a nice condition. The Fourier transform has a first finite moment. But actually, the best conditions are in terms of Bezov spaces. So these are variations of Sobolev spaces. And uh, Vladimir Bela is one of the world, the, it's probably the world leading, leading expert on this. His conditions in terms of Bezov spaces are sufficient and almost necessary. So they're very close. It's almost even only, if not quite, but there's not much daylight between the two. Okay. So what can you do with this object? 
Well, I said already, spectral theory, eigenvalue counting functions, inverse spectral problems, trace formulas, spectral averaging, localized localization for random Hamiltonians, spectral shift functions have been used. Scattering theory. That's a really interesting thing. I have a little bit to say about this today, later. So some rules, like Levinson's theorem, time delay, but perhaps the most uh, remarkable formula is the one by Biermann and Krein from 1961 or 2, which says that the determinant of the scattering matrix, the logarithm thereof, is a spectral sheet function for the pair of operators. So that's a very, very remarkable connection now with the continuous spectrum, so with scattering theory. I will have a lot to say about what Xi does on the discrete spectrum. We are coming to that in a few minutes. All right, so these Levinson type theorems are really some rules, for instance, Friedel's sum rule in, in, in solid state physics. Statistical mechanics uses trace functionals index theory. I will talk about this subject on Wednesday. And obviously, almost everywhere where you have a pair of self adjoint operators, that is, that is close enough. Okay? So there's lots you can do with this. Okay, so I want to start with some examples. Here's a joke. It's not a bad joke, but it's a joke. It's a fundamental theorem of calculus. So if your Hilbert space is, so your operators are real numbers. Why not? Okay, then it, the Newton Leibniz formula fits into this with the spectral shift function, the characteristic function of the interval from H0 to H. I said it's a joke, but anyway, why not? Here's a much more interesting and non trivial example the finite dimensional case. You one should always try these things in finite dimensions and then see what happens when you go to infinite dimensions. Actually, in this case, finite dimensions are quite misleading, although nice to start with, but very misleading. You will see why. So let's do, let's do matrix theory for a short period. So I'm looking at an n by n self-adjoint, or symmetric, or whatever you want to call it, matrix. No difference in this bounded case. So we're in Cn now, finite dimensions. The spectrum, finitely many eigenvalues, may be degenerate, so some of them could be equal to each other, that's all right. Then I'm sort of writing down the spectral representation for such a matrix. You can write it as a sum where you multiply certain projections onto eigenvectors by the eigenvalues. Okay. Now, if I want to be a little more formal, I introduce this spectral family for the interval from minus infinity to lambda, which really is just the sum of all those lambdas. So you look at the projections here, and you only sum over those so that the eigenvalue is less or equal to lambda. Okay. Now you employ a Stiltes integral. So this is a little, actually, if your functions are Continuous, it's basically a Riemann still this integral, but normally you should think in terms of Lebesgue. But why do I do this? I want to describe functions of operators, functions of my matrix in this particular case. So here, when you introduce this object, you can write this sum, which the one we started out with, as an integral. And for functions, pretty much the same happens. You replace the eigenvalue by a function of the eigenvalue, or when you use the continuous version, the Stiltes integral version, you replace lambda by f of lambda. That's functional calculus, but now applied in a very simple matrix situation. Okay, so let's take this um, for granted. And this works for very general functions f, so you don't have to be smooth. Let's say bounded measurable is good enough for the time being. Okay, what happens with the trace of f of h minus f of h zero? Remember that was the main formula on the first non-trivial page here. This was the thing in the box. Trace of f of h minus f of h zero. Now we are working with matrices. 
Okay? So, here's the trace again. I used the continuous version, so the Stiltius integral version. Then I uh, slightly rearrange. I take the trace inside. And there I am. This is my function C. All I have done is I have basically integrated by parts. So what that tells us in the finite dimensional context, this function C is really just the trace of the difference of the spectral families. And that's what's so misleading. This isn't true in infinite dimensions. Okay, so this can only work in finite dimensions. Which is too bad, because it's, it's the most natural expression for C. And you would like it to be true always, but no. It, life is not that simple. Okay? So here's actually uh, a situation that Mark Hine discussed. He, he used uh, rank one perturbations to find a counterexample. In fact, he, he played with uh, half-line Schrodinger operators and different boundary conditions at the finite endpoint. Uh, you can make the resolvents into self-adjoint operators. There are differences in rank one. And this is the example here. So this is already wrong in infinite dimensions. Even if h minus h0 is rank one, the simplest non-trivial perturbation. Right? That's trace class. So in infinite dimension, this is hopeless. This is not how it works. But in finite dimension, it's always true. Anyway, it's, it's, it's nice for warm-up. But it's not good for future uh, discussions. So we need to do something else. And this is what I'm uh, warming up to now. So we'll, uh, oops, sorry for that. We'll recall uh, the trace again, sum of eigenvalues, the determinant again is a product of the eigenvalues. And now I'm introducing a perturbation determinant. Think of this as determinant of h minus c divided by determinant of h0 minus c. For matrices, that would be true, but in infinite dimensions, you have to finesse this with the operator times the inverse. Okay? And you can also rewrite it, of course, in this form. And now you realize this was part two of, this was my relative trace class condition. This was part two. So this comes naturally out of this perturbation determinant consideration. So really think of this as this here, okay? In finite dimensions, matrix case, this is what this would be. In infinite dimensions, you cannot do that, but you can do that as a substitute. It's just as good as this, actually, when it comes to analytic properties, zeros and poles. It behaves the same. Here's an example that uh, answers one of your, your, your earlier questions. So in one dimension, H0 de Laplacian, h to the Laplacian plus v. So for instance, v having a first finite moment, real valued so that everything's self-adjoint. Then this perturbation determinant is what's called the Joost function. So those of you who have seen scattering theory, the Joost function is a very well-known subject there. It turns out to be exactly this determinant, or if you want this here. For those who have seen stability, of nonlinear differential equations in terms of linearization, people have introduced the so-called Evans function. Turns out to be the ones who introduced it didn't know about Joost. It's totally identical. But two different groups that didn't talk to each other for a while invented a different name, but it's the same object. Anyway, it's all the same, this perturbation determinant. So, now I can define C for you. At least I can do it in this uh, simple case where, in case one, where H minus H zero is a uh, trace class. This also works if we are in case two, where V times the resorbent of H zero was trace class. It's a little more tricky in the, in the in most interesting case where just the difference of resorbents is trace class. But something very similar works as well, so I'm gonna stop uh, and just tell you the simpler versions here. So here's what you do. You take the perturbation determinant, you look at it at lambda plus i epsilon. So this is in the upper half plane now. Epsilon is supposed to be positive and small. You take the argument that's im log. Take the argument of your perturbation determinant and go to the limit. 
One can show that's non-trivial, but that's partly what Krein also did. This limit exists for almost every lambda. So Lebesgue almost everywhere. And that's exactly our Krein spectral shift function, except for a factor pi normalization. So here is again a repeat from what we just had. This object D is just the, rel the perturbation determinant. So you can write it either like this or like that. In this case, where you are in case one, so the difference of H and H0 is trace class, C itself is L1. That's not true in general. Normally, it's locally L1. And you have to divide by 1 plus lambda squared to surely make it finite, the integral over the whole real line. Sometimes dividing by 1 plus mod lambda is enough, but not always. Not in the third case, for sure. But in this particular case, life is easy. It's just an L1 function. And you can show, for instance, when you compute the L1 norm, it's less or equal to the trace norm of the difference of h and h0. Right? This exists, of course, now by assumption. And when you compute the integral itself, it's exactly the trace of the difference of h and h0. So, yeah, I should say, and I said this already, so this formula star, oops, sorry for that. Yeah. This existence, is, is it based on, on a, I mean, properties of analytic functions? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So, Krein actually introduced this function rank by rank. So, he writes his trace class operator as a sum of rank one pieces, and if you just do a rank one piece, that perturbation determinant is a even linear function. So it, therefore, it has this normal or non-tangential limit. So the real ax, axis almost everywhere. So that's, it's, a, it's a complex analytic uh, approach, yes. OK, so this formula applies to the second case that we discussed, where V times the resolvent is in the trace class. So this, uh, this applies already to one-dimensional Schrodinger type operators, as long as the potential has a finite first moment. Now, in this case, you can no longer say that C is L1, but this is finite. You see, you weigh a little, so it's a weighted L1 property that is satisfied. And then, as I said, you can also do the hardest case. You have to be a little more careful. Anyway, so I always thought that Lipschitz did it for the rank one case, but I was surprised to see that UC seems to teach me otherwise. So we need to. Oh, well, we need to. We will, we will find out sooner or later. <laughs> okay, let me say a little bit about the properties of this function, say on the discrete spectrum, and then in the end, a little uh, what one can do in the uh, continuous spectrum case. So if you are on an interval a, b, and you go a little to the left and a little to the right, and the dimension of the range of the spectral projection of h0 is finite, then this difference of c at b from the left and this here from the right is actually the dimension of the, the difference of the dimension of the range of the spectral projection. So in other words, if it's finite, it counts eigenvalue differences including multiplicities, OK? That's why I said at the very beginning, eigenvalue counting function, or differences of eigenvalue counting functions. That's what this function can do for you if you have discrete spectrum. If you stay away from the essential spectrum, which automatically by these three conditions that we had would be the same for h and h0, this function is piecewise constant. It jumps at eigenvalues both at eigenvalues of h0 and of eigenvalues of h, but in opposite direction. So for h0, say it goes up, and for h, it goes down, or the other way around, depending on I, I may have my, actually here it's written anyway. So if you take a look at this, you see if you take c from one side, say from the right, this is the jump at lambda 0, right? And it's the difference of, yeah, for h0, it goes up, for h, it goes down. And m here is the multiplicity of the eigenvalue, if there is an eigenvalue. Of course, these numbers can be 0. It's OK. In fact, if there is no eigenvalue of either one, it doesn't jump at all. Okay? It jumps according to differences of multiplicities. So that's what is uh, repeated again here. So it pre on the, away from the essential spectrum, so on a discrete spectrum, it re represents a difference of 
to eigenvalue counting functions. So it's an interesting object already for that reason. Now, when you're bounded from below, which is uh, what you need for a semigroup application, otherwise you cannot define a semigroup, then one typically normalizes this function by being zero below the combined spectra. This function C is a little devious. It's defined up to a constant at first. So you cannot nail the constant. There, were, there was a phase, an argument involved. Uh, the argument has ambiguities. So there's a there's constant ambiguity in, in this, uh, this function. For, ch for jumps and all that, they are relative. It doesn't make a difference. But for absolute values of C, it makes a difference, right? So anyway, in the, in the bounded from below case, one eliminates this totally by normalizing it to be zero near minus infinity. There is an interesting, well, if you want, chain rule. If you want to go from H0 to H2, you can do this by going from H0 to H1, and then from H1 to H2, add up, you get the C function in the same bounded case. This is a little tricky and not true the way it's written if you're not bounded from below. OK, I promised the biermann krein formula a little earlier, scattering theory. So here's what we can say what this function does at, uh, uh, on the, uh, let me say, absolutely continuous spectrum to be a little more precise. So this is about the continuous spectrum now, scattering theory. We just saw a similar formula that Hermann used. He had direct integral decompositions because he had a symmetry. Something was translation invariant. Here it's, a, it's something that commutes with uh, H0, so you can diagonalize with respect to H0. And your scattering operator, without really going into great detail, can be written as an integral over the fiber scattering matrices. So this is what physicists like to call the scattering matrix at fixed energy lambda. It's not a matrix, it's an operator. It acts in L2 of the spheres in n dimensions. Oh, yeah. The spheres then n minus one dimensional. But never mind. And I'm cheating a little here. So what I do is. Actually, not necessarily. Um, it works uh, as long as you have uniform spectral multiplicity, say infinite, which you would have for Laplacian. Okay? Now, if you have non-uniform multiplicities, you have to divide this up and be much more careful with this direct integral. But for uniform spectral multiplicity, it's a correct statement. What is always correct is what's written here, even though that's not obvious then from, from this formula. If, if you have different multiplicities involved, how do you get different multiplicities of your continuous spectrum? Imagine in one dimension a potential that goes to one asymptote on one end and to a different asymptote on the other end. In between the two asymptotes, you will have spectral multiplicity one. Above, you have spectral multiplicity two. Okay, so it's easy to construct examples we do have, and then this is cheating what I'm doing here, okay? So, but the formula here, oops, this one is still true. So you take the determinant, take the logarithm, divide, and you get the spectral shift function on the absolutely continuous spectrum. So again, I'll go back to my one dimensional simple example for now. You have a potential with first finite moment. This thing was the half line. Yost function, so this is uh, one way of characterizing it. But on the continuous spectrum, or in this case, absolutely continuous spectrum from zero to plus infinity, you can actually characterize it as the scattering phase shift. That's exactly what this log dead would represent. So it's a well-known object, well-known to physicists for a long time. And eventually, people figured out it's the Krein spectral shift function. Ah, that's interesting. So I'm sorry for the C almost disappears. This is a red C, but somehow uh, doesn't, it doesn't quite work with blue here as a background. All right, so let me, let me describe a little more precisely what you can do in one, two, and three dimensions, okay? So I'm now, uh, I will show that this is the condition that is satisfied in these uh, three 
cases, one, two, and three dimensions. I, um, at this point, I'm a little more, actually, I'm not yet at dimensions. I'm a little more abstract here, but eventually I will, uh, I will apply this to uh, Schrodinger operators in one, two, and three dimensions. What I do at the moment is I use a factorization approach. I suppose my interaction V, that's the difference of H and H0 here, this is sort of abstract still, can be factored in two pieces. Okay, suppose you have a potential. How do you factor it in two pieces? Take the square root and maybe put a signum there because uh, the function may change sign, right? But apart from a signum, it's mod v one half times mod v one half. So it's trivial in concrete cases and we will do this then. But at the moment, I don't have to assume this. What I need to know is a few properties. I need to know that if I have b on the left of the resolving of H0 and a on the right, but since a is unbounded, I better take the closure the closure here, so this implicitly assumes that there exists a bounded closure. These two guys should be Hilbert-Schmidt. So see that there's a two here. And then it depends, and this is something where the dimension in the concrete applications will enter the game. Either this combination where you have B on the left and A on the right, and you close because this A on the right is unbounded, so you need to worry a little about that, is either trace class or Hilbert-Schmidt. This thing will be applicable to one dimension. This thing will be applicable to two and three dimensions. But it doesn't apply. This would not apply in two and three, but this applies. Then you can actually show that your perturbation determinant in the first case is just the freedom determinant, one plus B, and it's this operator here. For a few experts in the audience, that's a biermann schwinger kernel. Okay. So abstract. And in the other case, where you're only B2, this wouldn't make sense with a freedom determinant. So you use the next best thing, the modified freedom determinant. Yeah? No, no. Just difference of resolvance trace class. Yes, with certain properties, you see. I need Hilbert-Schmidt properties. So quadratic form perturbations would be okay. Yeah, this is for, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, instead of the column, I should have my, have my uh, quotation marks. Sorry for that. Yes, you're right. I, I, that, that's sloppy. But it, it, it really means that so what I have in mind is not, not, not this literally, but for instance, quadratic form better patients. Yes, 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 yes. And in fact, even, even for the one-dimensional example, where the potential is so that its first moment is finite, you already need quadratic forms. Only if you are L2, you get away with operator better patients theory. If you are Locally L1, you need quadratic forms. So quadratic forms are everywhere, lurking in the background when you apply this. Okay, so let's see. Well, here is uh, basically a repeat of what we had, uh, putting things together in the abstract context. So in the first case, when you had a, the D itself, the freedom determinant, then one can show that this is sort of a an anal that, that, that's an infinite dimensional analog of a formula well known for matrices. So let me go back maybe for a second. Uh, yes, here you see this is my perturbation determinant, okay? And I'm taking a logarithmic derivative with respect to z, ddz log. Well, it so happens that happens that that is the difference, the trace of the difference of the resolvent. That's well known in matrix theory, but it this is one of the nice examples where it extends to infinite dimensions under the assumptions that we have. And you can, in any case, either side express in terms of the spectral shift function. Now, you do it in a little more tricky way in the modified freedom determinant context, because then you need three objects under the trace. You see, there's one more term here, this guy here. And then you can express all that in terms of... Uh, See again. So here is the concrete situation now. One, two, three dimensions, Schrodinger operators. 
So uh, very quickly, H0 is the Laplacian. Usual Sobolev space is the domain. It's an unbounded operator. I do the form sum. So here's the Q. Q is for quadratic form. Okay. So this is already needs forms. Uh, v can be L1, real valid. So here I drop the first moment. Um, it might be OK, actually. So I might not need uh, the, the first moment here, but I'm, I'll, I'll, I, I, I need to rethink this. But it, it, it sure is probably right, so it's OK. Anyway, here's my factorization. You see u and v, they're basically mod v 1 half. And well, if necessary, put a signum in there, which is a bounded operator anyway of norm 1. So it doesn't change anything. And then you can verify in one dimension. So here's dx. This is a trace class object. So that's actually true under L1. So this is, this is correct. Uh, you have to be away from the real axis, though. So z uh, away from the spectrum, to be precise. Uh, if you're on the spectrum, this is not true. Then you need more. It's actually true with the first finite moment then, but not, not, uh, not as it's written here. And in that case, uh, of course, the difference of resolvents is also trace class. Uh, you have also, so let me see. Yes. So I'm totally in one dimension, I realize. So all of this is in one dimension now. You see, there's dx, not d2 or d3x, but just dx. So then all of this is true. And of course, you get uh, the formula we just saw abstractly in the special case of one dimensional Schrodinger operators. No modification of the determinant is necessary here. But if you go on to two and three dimensions, you have to modify. And so what you do is basically the following. H0 is still your Laplacian. Now it's in H2 of Rn. N is 2 or 3. You do a quadratic form perturbation, so a more sophisticated addition of H0 and V. Uh, good examples for this in three dimensions are L1 potentials that are Rolnik. The Rolnik class is written down here. That's a Hilbert-Schmidt condition if you look very carefully. Because this is the integral kernel of the Laplacian at zero energy the, of, of its resolvent. So this is really a Hilbert-Schmidt condition. And something similar one does mimics in two dimensions. But there is an extra delta here, which needs to be positive. So this is sort of the analog of a, a Rolnik condition in two dimensions. And um, in, then, in, in that context, we need to modify our determinant. So what is true? Well, first, you factor V exactly how you factored it in one dimension. There's no difference. Then this guy is not trace class. But in two and three dimensions, it will be Hilbert-Schmidt. It's actually uh, basically in three dimensions, you can see this from the Rolnik condition we just, we just uh, looked at. So the difference of resolvents, though, is trace class. So you don't need Hilbert-Schmidt here. This is trace class. This guy is trace class. And you have a situation that this becomes the logarithmic derivative, but now of the modified Fretum determinant. So a little bit of literature. How am I doing with time? I have half an hour, sort of, right? Yeah, OK. So that's not bad. So. A name you see a lot here is uh, Dima Year 5. He has written a lot in part with Biermann, in part uh, on his own. There are several books by him. Uh, it's a great source for everything I, I told you so far. And a lot more. A lot more. Okay, I'm just scratching the surface. He really goes deep. So. Let me, uh, in my second part, go to a uh, more tricky subject. And that's the subject of approximations. You would like to handle complicated situations by approximating them with simpler situations where you feel you have a handle on them. And so the natural question is, if you have a sequence of operators Hn that goes in a reasonable sense, and we have to talk about what is reasonable, to an operator h, and say you have a fixed h0, you would like to say that the spectral shift function functions, the sequence of spectral shift functions of h0 and hn, in some sense, 
goes to that of H0 and H. Well, that's a lot easier said than done, as it turns out. And uh, until about a little over a year ago, there was very limited information about this subject. So let me describe, this is sort of more recent stuff. And uh, unfortunately, at one point, really technically, but it's a good thing that I uh, have to stop uh, soon enough so then I can cut this short a little. So anyway, uh, maybe I shouldn't uh, cut my course as short. So this is with Alan Carey. He was already mentioned by Herman. And there is a, uh, Roger Nichols is, a, is now at uh, Tennessee in Chattanooga, former postdoc of mine, and Levitina, so Galina, Dennis Podapov, and Fedor Sukhochev is part of the Australian mafia I'm uh, associated with uh, for a number of years now. So basically since 2009, 2010. So anyway, uh, let's uh, slowly warm up to this. So here's, I'm, I'm going to do two different things in this talk. So one is the approximation argument that I just mentioned. But there is another thing I would like to know. I would like to know when in certain trace ideals, functions of such differences can converge. It so happened in our work on the Witten index, we needed this. This was absolutely vital. We couldn't get around it. We couldn't do anything directly. We had to approximate. So this was a natural question. Also, another natural question is the following. And I mentioned this already uh, uh, with respect to higher dimensional problems. It's nice if you get away with the difference of resorbance being trace class. But in general, it's not true. In multi-dimensions beyond three, what I just showed you is not, is not working. It's not true. So what do you do? Well, you would like to be able to control things in terms of powers of resolvent differences. All right? That's why you see this M here. So we really would like to control these guys in terms of these guys. Now, there are some surprises along the way. This is not trivial, first of all. And not always true either. But in any case, uh, I think we figured out a way of, uh, of working with this. I need some abbreviations, otherwise my formulas get too long. So this T here is the mth. You see, I have resorbance to the mth power here. A and B now, and A and B, and they play the role of H0 and H. So I've changed notation a little according to that paper that I just uh, mentioned, OK? So if, if you think of Uh, possible, I mean, what, how would you apply it? Yes, so, yes, exactly. I mean, that, that, that's one, one idea. But in the limit, you need something that's trace class. And if you are in high, high enough dimensions, you have to put your M sufficiently large, depending on dimension. So you see, for one, for one two, and three dimensions, M equals one was enough. No longer for four dimensions. You can, you can view, yes, you can view this as, this is just one example. You can view, sometimes you multiply by projection operators which go to one strongly. Sometimes you say you do a finite volume approximation which goes to the, so all of these are models behind, behind this. Yeah, these, are, these, are, these are good examples. And we have actually used both in, in, in different contexts. But sometimes it's just a projection operator. You multiply from left and right with a projection which goes strongly to one. And then you hope you can control it. <laughs> OK, so this is a little, de little definition. T is the, like the mth power of the resolvents. And here, the same thing. But you have a sequence of A's now and B's. So here, actually, we allow both A and B to vary. Sometimes in applications, one of them is fixed. And just the other is a sequence that goes to a limit. So we'll, we'll see both situations later. And so. Here is what we, uh, what we want to do. We want to control functions, function differences in a BP norm. So think of B as 1, 2, and so on, right? I mean, there's no need to stop with Trace Klaus and Hilbert Schmidt. You can do more general cases. And so we can do it actually for any P between 1, excluding infinity. So compact is not good enough. Anyway, so here's what we want to do. We want to control these guys in terms of Powers of resolvents. Now notice the curious thing here. I have two, two numbers here. 
different ones, okay, in general. You cannot control it with just one, it turns out. There are counter examples. It's just not possible. So that was one of the surprises in the game. Another thing that uh, you should think about, when M is 1, and you look at the difference of resorbance and say you want it to be trace class, then you would say, well, if it's true for 1A, it's true for all A in the intersection of the resorbance sets. This is utterly wrong for higher powers. So that's a warning that actually wasn't totally obvious to us when we started this game. Yes, I have an example. It's in the, it, it, that's a very, very sweet one uh, with projection operators. It's as simple as it gets in the paper. I, uh, I mean, this, that's a longer story to this because at first we thought we could get away with one, but the referee caught us. The referee knew more about this subject than we did. And then we had to redo the whole paper in terms of more than, and in fact, in some cases, we have to assume it for all Z in the intersection of, uh, of the resorbance set. So, so there, is, there are some bad surprises if you go from just resorbance to powers of resorbance. This is perhaps the most important thing you should take away from this lecture today. Uh, resorbance and powers, it's not the same. This is tricky. Anyway, uh, what, so what can we do? Well, actually, we can control quite, quite an interesting class of functions. It's defined in terms of this class here. You see the M is, of course, the power that you see in the resorbance there. And, well, I mean, there are some assumptions about boundedness of derivatives and then asymptotic behavior. And it is assumed that the asymptotic behavior to plus and to minus infinity with this function, with this uh, F-zero is the same, okay? Now, maybe just for simplicity, C-zero infinity functions, so compactly supported functions, are nicely contained in there, okay? But you can, you can do much, much, there's much more in this class, of course. So that's the function class for which we can prove something, okay? In, in, in exactly this form. So this C here will be a fixed constant independent on, of F. Ah, it, that I'm not saying that, but it, it will be in, um, let me see. Well, we'll get to that. Let me, uh, let's, let's go on in this. So that was the first thing uh, we wanted to do bound differences of functions in appropriate trace ideal norms in terms of powers of resolvance. Okay? The other is what I just said a little earlier. We would like to have something about convergence of spectral shift functions. Okay? You fix now A0 and you vary the other guy. So there's a B tau. Think of this as Bn. And Bn goes to B or B0 here in a particular way, we will discuss the way, has to do with resorbent power convergence. And then we cannot say point-wise, this is not true, but in an L1, in a weighted L1 sense, it is true. Okay, so that's a relatively new result. Uh, let me say one thing that's uh, important here. We are assuming no spectral gaps whatsoever in B0 and therefore B. Uh, why? Because this comes from our index theory uh, applications. We want to discuss Dirac operators, which are massless. Those have no spectral gaps. If you have a spectral gap, life is a lot simpler. Because then you sit, you go into that gap, you, the resolvent at such a point is a self adjoint operator, and a lot of other techniques are available, and you don't need any of this. But boy, once your spectral gap closes, life is complicated. And you will see that the only way, at least the most efficient way to handle this is with double operator integrals. That's a heavy machinery uh, about which the uh, Australian mafia are, are the world experts on, on this by now. Anyway, so this is what we wanted to do. Approximation and boundedness in terms of resolvance. And you see, this continuity result will also be in terms of continuity of uh, powers of resolvance. Okay, so powers of resolvance is the overarching thing here for the last few minutes. So let me do a brief timeout, five minutes, on uh, double operator integrals. It's uh, a heavy machine. That this is really real and functional analysis in a combined in a highly non-trivial manner. But a few things one can understand uh, even when 
when he's not uh, involved in this at all. So there's a little history, goes back to the other crime, that's Selim, not Mark, Daletsky. Birman and Solomiak in particular, they really made it into a machine that works uh, very well, well-oiled machine. Uh, Pella again, we ha saw him already, and then there is uh, Feda Sukhochev in particular, and now his students. So, what's the main goal in this game? Well, you have two self-adjoint operators, again A and B. You have a function f, sufficiently nice for L. Try to represent the difference of functions of f and b as a steel disintegral, a double steel disintegral, in terms of the spectral families of A and B. Okay, how would you do, how would you get around that? Well, before I uh, get to that, let me mention a second interesting uh, uh, approach here. That's part of the game. This has to do with a bounded transformer. So what's a transformer? Well, that's actually something that, that acts on the space of operators and gives you a new operator. So sometimes this is used in the trace class context, which is what I'm doing here today. But on Wednesday, I might actually do it in the bounded operator case. So there are two opposite cases, it's almost like L infinity and L1, so uh, uh, at, at two different ends of the spectrum, of the P spectrum. Anyway, so we would like to find the transformer here that maps trace class operators in the trace class operators so that you can represent this as a you know, still this double integral in terms of the spectral families. So here's the operator T you want to transform. The guy sits in the middle here. And here's a certain function that, that defines this transformer. We'll see what classes of functions we can handle in a, in a minute or so. But before I do that, let me, let me motivate these double operator integrals. And so what do I do? I go back to finite dimensions. That's a, it's a cheat, of course. We saw already that's very dangerous in the spectral shift function context, but it's, a, it's not bad in this, uh, in this context here. So I have two self-adjoint matrices for a moment. I again represent them in terms of uh, the spectral projections. You see these are now, the, I, I called them P before, now I call them E, but for the point lambda j, okay? So this, is the, this measures the jump at lambda j, difference from right minus difference from left. And I do the same for B, and I call the spectral family EA and EB. And then what, what do I know about this? Well, obviously I know the first line. This is just putting in definitions. Uh, we saw this before. We saw how to go from a matrix to a function of the matrix using the spectral family. Okay, so I'm doing it again. Then I start to manipulate this a little. You see, I divide and multiply. Well, it looks like uh, tautology, and it is at this point. But then I rearrange this a little. And out comes, after you resum this, out comes this here. So you see I have f of a minus f of b. I have a double sum, which you could think of a double integral. I have a function phi. That's the guy you just saw before. That's this guy here. I also have a t. Look at that. My t is exactly the difference of a and b. Okay. So it looks like what you just saw. So for matrices, this is pretty straightforward. Now, going from finite to infinite dimensions is a tough slog. This is not trivial. So there is, in fact, a biermann solomiak type formula, which looks exactly what we just saw. The sums go into integrals. Looks the same otherwise. This is the same, the A minus B, the spectral families. But now it's a, a double operator integral. And you have to be very careful with these objects. Sometimes it's not even clear that some of these objects you're dealing with are measurable. In fact, happened to Biermann and Solomiak that they had to write after 10 years or so, somebody found a gap and said, you have to prove this is measurable. Well, they could do it, but it was long after the fact. Right? So this is a, it's a, tricky, it's a tricky business, but it's, it's sound today Enough people have looked at it and used it in many different ways. 
So anyway, here's a little more about this bounded transformer. The function class is typically a Wiener class. So you see, you have products of functions. So it separates under an integral, and you have a certain weight here. So those are typically situations where one can apply this with success. So OK, now comes the, the tough part. And in a sense, I'm, I'm happy to speed this up a little. It's, it's getting late anyway. And this is where it gets technical. And there's nothing I can do. It's the full force of uh, a good part of the full force of this uh, double operator integral theory. So here's a transformer again in terms of a function phi uh, that factors. Um, so. That's part of part of a very tricky game, okay. but but one can make sense of it, not without tears. Okay, this this is no, it's highly non-trivial. It's it's only easy in the matrix case. It's never easy again. So yes, the, the, nothing is obvious about this formalism. And as I said, even the the masters got tricked at one point by a measurability question. I mean, luckily enough, they recovered very nicely and fixed it, but it had to be fixed. OK, so typically, uh, uh, see the transformer then has the t in the middle and the function of a and the function of b uh, on the left and right. So we'll probably say something about this function soon. Uh, there are multipliers. So you see the fees which I had in the subscript of the, of the uh, transformer a little earlier. They are products, typically, again. So. Here is a little more about this function phi that, uh, so this goes back to Biermann Solomyak, uh, and they did this very thoroughly in 03. So you have products of functions and then a certain uh, measure here. Uh, you have certain properties for this function, alpha and beta, square integrability with respect to that measure. And the key thing here is that one can actually estimate the norm of these objects in terms of these constants that you see here. OK? This is a continuation of it. So uh, under certain uh, weight, weights here in the Fourier transform, and this is a, a tricky Fourier transform. It's a partial Fourier transform with respect to the first variable. So C here, not uh, the other one. Uh, again, you can uh, discuss. Uh, phi and bounded. So here is something that leads to a work by a 5 uh, from 2005. So he actually was the first to go into that direction. And we rely heavily also on, on, on what he has done. So he looked at certain kernels that satisfy particular properties with derivatives and limits, and then shows that, in fact, the transformer is a bounded. And here, uh, here it's from uh, the bounded operators, here it's in the trace ideals all the way from 1 to infinity, infinity excluded. So he, uh, he already established the existence of such transformers. Uh, yeah, there is a bit more about this. And here we come slowly to the meat of uh, what's interesting for us. We want to describe differences of powers of resolvents. And put them in a trace ideal. So for instance, trace class, or Hilbert-Schmidt, or anything in between, all the way to infinity. In this particular case, one could even sometimes work with the bounded operators, but I'm not sure I do, do that much with it today. So one of the functions that are associated with uh, these powers here is a function phi that looks like lambda to the m asymptotically. It's monotone, because the C here is supposed to be positive. And so uh, that's something we're going to use. And with that function, so asymptotically like a power, and you will see the power has to be odd for good reasons. You want to be monotone, right? not, not, not even where you turn around. You can actually prove the following result. So this is already into the direction of what we are interested in. For such functions phi, you can take the difference of resolvents and bound it in terms of powers of resolvents at two different a's, again. 
right? That's typically you get you cannot get away with one a in the resolving set. You need two. And then uh, here is uh, uh, a similar result of this type. So you see, now it's already for the function class f that I, I showed you a little earlier when we had the introduction to this. So the C0 infinity functions are part of that class, but quite a bit more is in there. Again, you can bound um, both the, uh, actually you can also do this in the bounded operator case here. So you can do it for trace ideas and can do it for bounded operators with the same adjustment uh, on the right hand side for bounded operators. So this is something uh, that he worked on and I don't know whether I said this somewhere, but M definitely here needs to be, a, I'm not sure I, I wrote it, but M needs to be an odd integer, positive integer. Now, this is uh, uh, more technical stuff. So now we're trying to, uh, to do approximations. So there's A and A, B and N, B. And again, uh, we're going through uh, these classes you saw a little earlier, this is abstract. I'm going to jump over this. But eventually, Biermann and Solomyak earlier, C73, showed that the transformer has continuity properties. So there's A and B N, and there's A, B, and the transformer goes in the appropriate trace ideal norm. Now, from now on, we are always going to assume that we have at least strong resolvent convergence of our sequences. We will need a lot more, but that's the minimum. So these are the assumptions here. It's a hypothesis. This relates to a lemma that we uh, that was actually due to Biermann and Solimac a little earlier. I'm gonna uh, gonna go over this a bit quicker. This is the again. This relates now to uh, yeah fives kernel K. So we had that a, a bit before. And in the end, given a hypothesis like this, so there's T, this is for abbreviations only, otherwise I have, uh, I have too much to write here. So you see here you have the difference of the resolvents of A and B, here you have the difference of the power of resolvents of A and B, and then uh, uh, you need that this converges, okay? Then you actually get as a consequence that you have convergence of this was one of my uh, things that we needed in the index, the written index business. You get exactly what we set out to do, namely that functions of a n mi minus function of a, function of b n minus functions of b, converges in the trace ideal for this class f m again. Okay, so that was one thing. Now let's go to continuity. The second part I wanted to do. So this is uh, the last four minutes. Continuity from now on will be for all z here, because my m is typically not 1. If m were 1, I only need to do this for 1 z away from the real axis. If m is larger, then 1, forget it. It's not true. We have a nice counterexample. You need it. Uh, the safe thing is to say, I don't know how many you need it, but probably for all. In any case, we have a, a bad counterexample where for a fixed power, this is zero, and therefore in any trace ideal, for one fixed C, and never again. It otherwise is a projection which is not, uh, not in any of the trace ideals. So very elementary counterexample, which lets you believe this is totally hopeless. So you have to, you have to adjust a little. So resolvents when M is one, and powers of resolvents really are different in this context. We again play with functions phi that look like lambda to the M, m larger equal to 2 now, but eventually m odd because I need monotonicity. And then yeah, 5 has actually already looked at uh, situations like this and saw that this is trace class. And so what we do now is we use a kind of um, change of variables formula, if you want, to go from one case to another, where you see we have trace class properties. And so this is an ordinary C function. And I use that to define my guy that I really want to discuss. Okay, so there's a change of variables formula behind this. And so the assumption, so, so if you do that, then the new C is not L1 with respect to the usual weight 1 plus 
mod lambda squared, which is what you get for m equals 1. No, no, you need m plus 1. You see, if m is 1, you get the old weight, but now you get a new weight. So it's only finite with respect to that weight, but then it is. And uh, you see there's the, the, the change of variables. Uh, in fact, if you do that, then this is the old situation. So you're reducing that case to something you know already. And uh, as a result, you can use, here's, really, here's the change of variables done explicitly. You can uh, reduce the trace of f of b0 minus f of a0 down to this nu c and f prime. But for which functions? Well, again, for this class f that we saw several times already. OK, so here is basically uh, a pseudo-matrix. It turns out that there is a metric when m is 1. It's not a metric when m is larger than 1. So there's another subtlety. But it's good enough. It's a pseudo-matrix. And uh, you basically now want convergence for all z's in, of powers of resolvance. So take that away as the basic uh, topology here. Uh, never mind the details. Little technically, but not too bad. So here is then uh, uh, one of the assumptions we're going to use, namely that in this topology, think of it as convergent in powers of resolvent differences for all z. That's, that's what you should take away as the topology here. Okay? And uh, within, the, within that topology, and this function phi that we, we had a number of times behaves like lambda to the m. m should be odd, so, it should, so that it, its derivative is uh, strictly bounded away from zero, so monotone. Then you can actually show that uh, you stay in the certain neighborhood here. Neighborhood here was defined in terms of, let me see whether we can find this quickly. Uh, yes, so this is the neighborhood. You see, it's, it's convergence in terms of powers of resolvance. And then the main theorem is this one here. So this is what I want to finish with and maybe one conclusion afterwards. So we have convergence in this generalized sense, powers of resolvent differences. Then uh, you have a change of variable formula and uh, if you apply it in a concrete situation, like sequences, or in this case nets, where a0 is fixed, but bn or b tau goes to b0, then uh, it works uh, in this weighted L1 case. So you have continuity in this sense, and the weight again is m plus 1 downstairs. Right? For m is always fixed here, fixed odd integer. And with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you very much. It's a pseudo-matrix because you can easily find that it produces zero out of non-zero elements. It's not a matrix. And that has to do with this, this, this devious counterexample that we, we found. So it's just not a matrix. But it, as a family of, of pseudo-matrix, it's, it's actually good enough. You get a reasonable topology. So it's almost as good as if it were a matrix. Don't know that. Would we'll have to think about that. I don't know. Can I? Is that finite even? Over all z? Ah, you're running all over the complex plane now. So I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Once again. It, 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 is a, it, is a, it is a topological space here uh, w with this pseudo-metric, okay? So, uh, actually, I don't think we were able, I don't remember now. This, this might have been one of the things we were not able to show. It may not be that nice. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to check. I, I will check. We thought about that at one point. I forgot what the answer was.
Maybe I can find it quickly. I actually brought that thing. No, we don't say, so I think we couldn't prove it. No, it, I, I, at least in the, uh, doing it fast, I cannot find it. So it seems we, we don't know. So it's not that simple, <laughs> not that nice. But it's a topology. And in, 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 in practice, it means convergence of powers of resolvents for all z. So, so just don't take for granted if you can prove it for one z, it works in other cases. No, you really need to show it for all z. Yeah. Yes, that's what it is, of course. Is that, uh, I mean, that's not something that I knew of. Is it the standard fact? Well, no. It's, it's the Biermann Cato invariance principle. Is it just Biermann principle? Yeah. 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 For the shift function, yeah. yeah. I, I know this. Yes, that's what, it, that's what it is. That's what it is. But it is, it, it's, it's basically a change of variable formula. But that's what it is. Biermann, Biermann Cato invariance principle. Mm -hmm. Thank you.